to greet you as you do that live right now. And so we thank God for all of our members who are tuning in and watching. We pray for you and we thank God for your life and we thank God for the things that he's doing in your life. And so for all of our visitors, whether if you're here in the body or absent in the sense that you're at home, maybe you're jogging watching. Maybe you're somewhere hanging out. Maybe you're having breakfast right now at the table and you got God's way up. Wherever you might be, bedroom, wherever, half dressed, doesn't matter. God bless you. We thank you for tuning in. And we're not ashamed of the gospel. So we're going to share that this morning, the gospel of Jesus Christ, as we prepare our hearts to hear the word of the Lord. And as you know, Customarily here, we stand on our feet as we honor the Lord. And for those of you who want to keep up this morning, who are watching us live, you can either take a look on the screen and you'll be able to stick with us and hear what the Lord has to say coming from Matthew, the 15th chapter, verses 21 through 28. We're reading from the NASB or SU translation which is the New American Standard Bible this morning. So take this journey with us as we prepare to read the word of the Lord. And here's what your Bible says. It says, Jesus went away from there and withdrew into the district of Tyre and Sidon. And the Canaanite woman from that region came out and began to cry out, saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is cruelly demon-possessed. Verse 23, But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and implored him, saying, Send her away, because she keeps on shouting at us. Really? Verse 24, but he answered and said, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
But she came and began to bow down before him, saying, Lord, help me. Verse 26. And he answered and said, It is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. But she said, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs feed on the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Yeah. Yeah. Verse 28, then Jesus said to her, O woman, your faith is great. It shall be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed at once. Yeah. What a mighty God we serve. Do I have a witness here? So, I would like to speak to you this morning with the subject titled, Lord, Lord I Need Your Help. Lord, I Need Your Help. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. When we look at this particular text, <laughs> we find Jesus, who's dealing with a moment of crisis, in the text. As he straddles along the coast of Tyre and Sidia, he's at the borders. And at the borders that he resides, he's at a place where he's near heathen territory. Territory of those who are antithetical to the word of God. Territory of those who worship other gods. It may be similar to Christians that may be witnessing along the way, and as they witness, they cross the borders of a Jehovah Witness building. Or you cross the borders of where Muslims reside. Or you cross the borders where a bunch of unbelievers who don't know God at all reside. Regardless of the fact Jesus was not intimidated by what people thought of him when he got close to those who did not know him. All right. Jesus didn't care about what people thought about him when he got close to those who were truly in need of him. Right. Still didn't move him. Jesus went too high minded to get close to those who were in desperate need of a savior. Yes, I wonder why we can't witness to unbelievers effectively. Maybe it's because too many of us are too afraid to get close to those <laughs> who don't have a real relationship with God. Well. Which might pop up the question, how close to God are you truly? If you can't get close to those, get near enough to assist and help somebody who's in need of your God's help. All right, all right. Because in the text, this sister recognized her God can't help her. <laughs> and because her God can't help her, she comes shouting out to Jesus. Okay. Not because she don't believe he's able, right. but because she's heard too much. She's seen too many examples of what God can do. And like the songwriter said as we grew up in the old church, what he's done for others, <laughs> yes, he can do the same for you. Yes. So when we look at the text, the first thing we notice is that the Bible calls her a Syrophoenician woman. Now why does the Bible want us to know anything about her background? Why does the Bible take the time to call her Syrophoenician. Maybe God wants us to know what's truly happening in the background of the text. For the word Syrophoenician actually points us to some historical black facts. Let's see if you can handle the truth of the Bible. Because the black fact of the text in Genesis, the 10th chapter, verse 6, you'll see the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and 
Canaan in verse 6. Now, why does the Bible want us to know who Ham is and who was his sons? Ham, the word Ham, according to Fasalt Bible Dictionary, actually means black or sunburnt as an African tribe. So the text is trying to teach us that not only is Ham black, sunburnt, Chocolate. I'm talking about Wesley Snipes and Deeper. <laughs> but the text is trying to tell us that Ham had cherry. I'm sorry, I just took my grandmother language real quick and said cherry. Ham had cherry, and his children named were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Cana. All right. Pastor, what's your point? The text is trying to teach us. That the sister in the text is of African descent. She is a chocolate sister. Hershey tea kiss. She's a black sister in the text who comes from a black dad named Ham who had a black wife who comes from the race of the Philistines where we get that big Philistine hero called Goliath. So the text is trying to give us some facts to help us understand that she's worshiping the gods of her day. She's crying out to the Lord and she's got everything against her, y'all. Because being a Syro Phoenician woman, she is a woman who's already outcast. She's a woman. And in biblical antiquity, a leader such as Jesus, one who would be considered a rabbi, would never have a physical and verbal engagement with a woman. So she's got her background against her because she's a Syrophoenician. And if you knew anything about them, you would know that these people were supposed to be wiped out and destroyed by Joshua and his troops. But the reality is, some of them survived because the children of God didn't finish the mission. And because they didn't finish the mission, we got this Syro Phoenician woman who's in the New Testament who was of the lineage of those who survived, many were destroyed. But survived the Old Testament Deuteronomy, and here we see her at what we know as the New Testament. Pastor, what's your point? We don't know why God allowed them to survive. She was supposed to be wiped out, but she's still here. That didn't move. <laughs> she was supposed to be destroyed, Brother Austin. She wasn't even supposed to be in this text if things would have went the way that they should have went. But in God's mercy, right. he didn't wipe out the whole bloodline, but some survived. Yeah, yeah. And because some survived, this woman is about to make Jesus, her whole life about to be turned around. And when God flips her life upside down, don't you think she's going to go back to some old Syrophoenician women and brothers and evangelize them when this is over to bring them to Jesus Christ? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do I have a witness in here who can testify that there's some stuff in your life you shouldn't have survived? There were some areas that you lived in that you should not have survived. There were some people that you was connected to some friends that you were hanging with, driving drunk in the car, acting crazy, and you got into a predicament that you should not have survived. But if it had not been for the mercies of the Lord, yeah. you ought to praise him this morning because you survived some stuff that should have killed you. Okay, yeah, some of y'all ain't been through nothing, evidently, because I don't have enough praisers in here who can testify that God has spared your life. You went up against cancer, you went up against sickness, you went up against COVID, you went up against danger in your neighborhood, you went up against all kinds of circumstances and situations, what the Lord saw you through. Yeah. So the text says, she 
she, she sees Jesus and she shouts out those famous words that still rings in the heart of those who are readers of the word of the Lord. She shouts out for mercy. And when she shouts out for mercy, she says, now son of David, when she's talking to Jesus, she says, have mercy on me. I'll say it again. She shouts out. This is a cry of desperation. She cries and asks for the Lord to have mercy on me, is the words that she requested. But the text told us her daughter was demon possessed. So why is she saying, have mercy on me? Y'all missed it. Her daughter is the one demon possessed. But yet when she comes to Jesus, she's asking Jesus to deliver her daughter and she says, have mercy on me. Okay, I wish I could speak to the mothers. Can I speak to the mothers who knows what it's like for your child, your daughter, your son to go through some stuff? And when your son or your child or your daughter go through some stuff, the stuff that they go through not only affects them, but it affects you. Right? And a mother's heart ain't going to just cry out for God to deliver their daughter, but God, help me. Because God, I just need you to help me get over the stuff I see my daughter going through. Yeah. And the way that you can help me is to deliver her. And when you deliver her, you'll be setting me free too. Yeah. Because any good mother in here knows for your daughter or your child to go through, it affects you too. Yeah. And so she sees them as one in the same. Whatever affects my daughter affects me. I wish I had just one or two ghetto mothers up in here. I know I got one or two. Yeah. It knows what it's like to have your child in a circumstance or a situation to where you like, who messing with who? Who, who is it? I, I, okay, maybe I'll speak to the Austin family because y'all got enough girls over here. Then if one little girl try to pick on the littlest girl, y'all would be like, where your sisters at? Where your sisters at? Y'all think y'all gonna jump my little girl? Go get the sisters, go get the sisters. Because reality is no parent is gonna stand by and watch somebody whoop on their child. And the text is showing us this sister's like, I'm not gonna stand by and watch the devil run havoc on my daughter. Right, 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 right. So she cries out to Jesus and she says, Son of David, Son of David. Have, have mercy, mercy on, on me. me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the text says, after she cries out, Lord, have mercy on me. Uh -huh. The text tells us, Jesus says, not a word. She cries out for mercy. And Jesus doesn't even respond to Sister Girl. So what do you do when you're in need and in desperate need of desperate help? You know what the Lord can do because you've heard it, you've seen it. You've seen what happened throughout the city. You've seen healed folks get healed, sick folk get healed. You've seen people possessed with demons get demons cast out. you see Jesus doing the work of the Father. And then when you ask, he's got nothing to say. <laughs> Could you imagine what her heart went? Is, is you just going to be silent on me, Jesus? I'm coming to you, seeking you, because I'm desperately in need of help. And the text says why she's asking, Jesus still silent. Y'all not feel me. Yeah. I'll never forget when my daughters, my daughter and my two sons went to Chambers Elementary School right over here in East Cleveland. Shout out to Chambers. And everybody who went there with my daughter, Rakia Sutton. And we know that there were times where my wife would be throwing, you know, almost like little parties in the office where they were selling popcorn, and selling different types of candy, and things of that nature. And while they were doing that, people would come in and get to buying that popcorn, buying that water, buying that popcorn. They're, they're fundraising. And I'll never forget, I was in there with my kids, and, you know, I'm making sure I put my money in the pot, and 
they're getting what they need. And some kids ran up to me who recognized my children. And they ran up to me saying, Daddy, Daddy, buy me some popcorn. And when they said, Daddy, I'm looking down. <laughs> when I got closer to my children, I said, Okay, y'all look to one And they came and ran and grabbed my leg. Can I have a couple of y'all just come grab, run and grab my leg and say, Daddy, Daddy, give me some popcorn. Come on, just give me two examples. Come on, give me two of y'all. Come on, run, run to my leg and say, give me some popcorn. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Come on, I need one more. I need one more. Come on, come on. Y'all scream, Daddy, Daddy, give me some popcorn. There you go. And while they asking me for some popcorn, I'm looking. And I say to myself, where is they, where is they mom at? Where in the world ain't daddy at? And I had the funds to pay for the popcorn. But I wouldn't pay for the popcorn because they came to me on the wrong terms. Thank y'all for your attempt. You can go back to your seat. They came to me calling me daddy when I wasn't their father. Right. And when they came to me calling me daddy, I did not respond. I was silent. Uh -oh. <laughs> okay, come on. Come on. I looked at them even though I had the power to purchase what they wanted. I had the power to pay for what they were desiring. I could not do it because they were not my children and I wasn't going to disrespect somebody else's child by giving them what their mother didn't give them permission to receive. Wow. What is the point of the text? The text is trying to help us understand that Jesus remained silent because he, she wasn't one of his children. She calls them by a name that she can't identify. Only the Jews knew him as son of David. Okay. Therefore, Jesus was silent because she came on holy grounds and she was still a sinner. So when she says this, Jesus is, is sitting there, standing there rather, while she's crying out. And because of it, the disciples come up and say, hold on, wait a minute. She getting on my last nerves. And the disciples jump in and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, Lord, we got this. Will you please send her away? Because she's crying out to us. <laughs> okay, let me, let me try that again. Yeah. She cries out, Son of David, have mercy on me. The disciples step up and says, we got this. Don't get too close. Lord, send her away. Uh -huh. For she cries after us. Where do we get the us from? <laughs> I never heard her cry out to his disciples. She cried out to Jesus. But I got a question to ask you. How do you handle people in leadership who are so arrogant that when you cry out for Jesus, because of their talents and gifts and who they're connected to, they take it as if you're crying out to them? Because the anointing is on their life and they have the word of God in their belly, they think, because they're arrogant and haughty, that somehow your praise gets on their last nerves because you're not praising in a way that they think is conducive to the environment. Who are we as leaders to tell people when they're crying out to God to be silent? Who are we as leaders to look to the Lord when people in the church are hurting and say, Lord, send them away? Amen. What kind of ministry is this that we see in the text? When we got people speaking on Jesus' behalf when Jesus didn't say nothing. Ah. Okay, that went over your head. I'll never forget. I was in church. And when I was at a church uh, quite a few years ago, I'll never forget a bishop was up. He was prophesying. He was a visiting bishop. He was prophesying. He was laying hands on folks. See folks fall out. And I'll never forget, I was sitting there, and I was already praying, asking God to bless me with a new job. Walked away from my job, started the ministry, which we know as Jesus, uh, God's Way Gospel Church. 
and started, let's play God's way. Elder Thomas jumped on, on board, jumped on the ship. We had that ship sailing and floating. Started off in the Lexington area. I'll never forget, I'm asking God to bless me. I need a new job. And I'll never get, forget the bishop called me up. When he called me up, he said, what is it that you need from the Lord right now? I looked and I said, I'm praying and asking God to give me a job. It's a job I've been praying for, but I can see myself in me. It's actually a job of ministry, and I just believe that this is something that I can do and be effective at, working with you. So he looked at me, and he said, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you that you got the job. Everybody in the building started shouting, y'all. And I stood silent. And as I stood silent, I said, Lord, is that you? And I instantly heard the Spirit say, I didn't say that. Sure. And while I was standing there, he was telling me to praise, hop, jump, and run around the church. And I stood there in defiance because the Lord told me that's not what he said. And the Holy Spirit said, you know my voice. That wasn't my voice. And I'll never forget, I stood there as he began to say what he say, say it, had to say, and I stepped back. And I said, I'm believing God for the job. And he said, brother, you're going to get that job this week. Well, that bishop was in town for that whole week. And I got the phone call two days later when they called me up and said, I didn't get the job, brother Austin. And as soon as I didn't get the job, I started shouting praise of God and I started running. Right. Because I recognized the Father's voice. <laughs> and watch this. Jesus didn't speak to the one who had the title. He was giving me a word that Christ didn't say when the Lord was silent. He took his authority to step in on Christ's behalf and speak a word that the Spirit didn't say. What are you saying, Pastor? We got to be careful when people prophesy to us. We have to be careful and discern what the Lord's will is, even when somebody in leadership says, this is what the Lord is saying. I have seen many times when people prophesy and that word falls straight to the ground. We've got to learn how to get to the place where we know the Lord for ourselves. Amen. Where we're not just getting secondhand so-called revelation or information, but we get our source of knowledge and wisdom straight from the fountain. Yeah. The fountain that flows from the Father, we should be receiving more confirmation than information. Because if we spend time with God long enough, he'll speak to us. He'll send people our way to confirm the direction that we'll go. He'll send people our way that God has ordained to push us into purpose to seek God's will. Even me as a pastor, if I prophesy it, make sure you put it on the shelf to see if that comes to pass. Because I may have to come back to you, and I thank God that I have it, that I may have to come back to you and repent and say that wasn't God, that was me. I wish I had leaders. That was mature enough to know when it's you and not God. I would rather somebody say, this is what I'm believing God for you, than for you to say God said this to you. Do we have any leaders in here who's humble enough to recognize that you're favored, but you're favored with flaws? And every now and again, you got to learn how to tell people, this is what I see. This is what I believe. And this is what the Lord has said. Do we know the difference in here this morning? Can we walk in humility to where we don't put people down and tell people lies that may often lead them away from the Lord? That's what the text says. Jesus looks at this sister and said, I have not come first. If you were to look at Mark's account, I have not come I have not come, or should I reverse that, when he's dealing with Israel, he says, I have come first to the household of Israel. When he says, I have come first to the household of Israel, this woman was sassy enough, street enough, and yet sister enough to understand if Jesus said that the house of Israel come first, uh, somebody got to get saved. 
she understood if somebody is first, then that implies that there's another opportunity that could be coming. So when Jesus says he came to the household of Israel first, the text says she fell on her knees and began to worship. What can we learn from a heathen in the text that many of us as Christians still don't get? She understood in the text the, the key to reaching to the Lord's heart was when God seemingly says, not yet. That doesn't mean that we go our own way and do what we want to do. But what she shows us in the text, that when God doesn't answer, worship while you wait. Uh, I wish I had some worshipers in here this morning. You understand the idea when God doesn't answer, when God gives an answer that seems to contradict your faith, until you know for sure, worship while you wait. She didn't quit being persistent, but the text says she began to kiss his feet. And as she worshiped, the word worship in the Greek means to kiss the foot of an individual. So as she worships while she waits, the text says in Matthew 15, 26, and he answered. Somebody ought to shout it right there when I said, and he answered. Oh my God, the text says, and he answered. Okay, y'all almost got your cue, but I didn't get enough shouts. I just want to move further. But the text said, and he answered. The text says, it is not good to take the children's bread, amplified version, and throw it to the little dogs. If you read it from the King James, that old language between the 1600s when it was created, which we don't speak that language anymore, the text actually says, not throw it to the dogs, but to the little dogs. Because in biblical antiquity, for a Jew to call a person a dog, that was usually a slang cuss word. So when Jesus says this to the sister, she could have took it in a negative sense. But when you really broke it and humble before the Lord, even when his answers go against your faith, God will provoke a question or a statement to keep the fellowship rolling. Listen. In other words, we don't really have good fellowship like we should till we're going through a struggle. And God will sometimes delay the answers so you can keep on talking. So you can keep on praying. So you can grow in your faith as you exercise your trust in the Lord. This is why God is patient with us and don't just give us everything we want. Because he knows he's not trying to raise a bunch of spiritual brats who think whatever they desire from their heart, they can call on God and receive it at a drop of a dime. Just like you don't want no natural brats in your house to get on your last, and I got to speak to the context of this church, black nerves. And when they get on your last nerves, you're like, listen, I got to tell you, no, not because I can't do it. But because I don't need strip natural brats who think life is going to hand you everything you desire. So when Jesus calls her a dog, if he would have been speaking 21st century, oh my goodness, half of y'all would have lost your mind. Half of y'all sisters in here would have went berserk. I'm telling you, you would have took off your heel. Oh God, you would have put your scarf around your head and said, no, Jesus did. If y'all want to tell me he's supposed to be the son of God, and this man just called me a dog? 21st century, it would sound like a female dog. <laughs> if you were to take that implication in the 21st century. In biblical century, it was equivalent to a cuss word as well as a slang word. Can you see the text? But when Jesus speaks to her in this context, the Greek is hidden and revealed in the Amplified to little dogs. So when he calls her a little dog, he does not trip. Can I tell you why, Brother Austin? Because little dogs is a term of endearment. Little dog 
is like we think 21st century. He's talking about a house pet. A dog is part of the family. Come on, all y'all dog lovers in there, shoot me some hearts. Come on, everybody who watching on Facebook and YouTube, shoot me some hearts because y'all don't like this one. Because my mother got a dog by the name of Honey. And we really can't call Honey a dog. Because my mama say, Eric, this is your little sister. And every time Honey come in, Honey wants to hug and fight at the same time. Right. Like honey really one of the siblings in the family. Right. So honey got her nerves to where when we eat, when honey want to eat, honey lifts up, hands propped near the table, and honey just sits there waiting for the crumbs to fall from the table. Right. But we know you don't feed a dog crumbs. <laughs> Is that what dogs truly eat? Crumbs? That falls from the table? Uh, let's look at the screen and understand what crumbs mean in biblical antiquity. To have crumbs, according to the Strong's Greek translation, it actually means leftovers. <laughs> King James Crumb's true biblical translation, leftovers. So she's asking for the leftovers that gets thrown from the children's table. Okay. So she's not asking for crumbs. She's asking for seconds. She recognized God is so good and that the table of the Lord is spread. And the feast of the Lord is going on. She recognized when God spreads the table, there's going to be enough for his children to eat. And even for guests to eat. I wish I had a witness up in here who grew up with me like I did in the 80s. And you could go over to your neighbor's house. Can't do that no more. You could go over to your neighbor's house when your neighbors are cooking and everybody can come over and eat dinner. Mm -hmm. right. You can eat at your neighbors down the street. You can eat at your neighbors at the corner. As long as your mother knew where you were, neighbors had no problem giving you what they had placed on the table. They would make sure that they gave their children their place first. <laughs> then they would bring you your place and let you have a seat at the table. So when the text is teaching us that, he's, that she's asking, for what the children have, watch this, that's left over. It actually doesn't mean that she's really just getting leftovers. Right. It really means that there's so much on the table <laughs> that when God blesses, he provides so much for his children uh -huh. that there's much more for us to share with those who are in need of what we have on the table. So the question I got for you this morning, are you inviting folks to the table? When was the last time you shared not only a meal, but the gospel of peace with somebody who was hungry for the Lord that you invited to the table? When was the last time as God's grace has flowed over your life that you understood that God's been so good to you, you can't keep all the clothes you got in the closet? There are times where God will tell you, don't give them them happy downs. But give them the one that's got the tags on it that you still ain't wore yet. Give them the shoes that's in the closet that you still ain't put on and still got, did I say something, <laughs> that still got the tags on them that you haven't worn in a long while because God's been so good to you. You ain't got just two pairs of shoes for two feet, but you got between 20, 50, 100, and 200 pairs that you can share with somebody else because after all, you only got two feet. So when Texas is teaching us that when God blesses us, he blesses us exceedingly, abundantly, above all we can ask for things, according to the power that works in us. So this is why Jesus didn't turn the sister down, but he spoke to her in her language. I don't care how ghetto you are this morning, the Lord can speak ghetto. The Lord can speak dignified. The Lord can speak in your accent. The Lord can speak prison. The Lord can speak in her language. That deal with your homosexuality.
Lord, I need your help. Yes, 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 yes. So anybody who's watching us right now, all of you who are watching us from Facebook and YouTube, if you need God's help, he's ready to assist you. Now here I come, let me know that the table is free and the feast of the Lord is going on. This is your opportunity to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Whatever you need from the Lord this morning, it's at the table. The Lord is able to provide. And it doesn't matter your background, whether if you're a sinner, whether if you're lost, whether if you've been an abuser, whether if you've been a liar, God can deliver you from all of that. This woman who was a sinner showed us that all we got to do is cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. God, I know I'm sinful. And some of y'all saying, Pastor, what, you, what is sinful? What is that? Is anything that God don't agree with? You're saying, Lord, I know you don't agree with this and that that I'm doing in my life. Father, help me, heal me. Deliver me from my past. Not only do I need you to forgive me, God, but help me to forgive myself. Help me to forgive myself for the choices that I made and the consequences I have to face. But I'm putting my trust in you today. That's all you got to do is come to him. Whatever you need is at the table. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask and pray that you bless your people right where they are. Strengthen them, guide them, lead them to the path of righteousness. Teach them your love, God. We thank you to people tune in on Facebook and YouTube because they wanted to eat from the table. They needed a word from the Lord. And regardless of what people have called you in the past or people call you present, even if they call you out your name, God has a term of endearment for you. He wants to welcome you into the family. All you got to do is say, Lord, come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe God raised him from the dead. And the scripture says in Romans 19, in chapter 10, 19, that by that confession, salvation is made from your mouth and from your heart. That's not what the pastor said. The Bible says, if you look at it, Romans 10, 19, and the scripture says that you should be Whatever you need, if you need prayer, go ahead, seek God right now. There's plenty of food at the table. There's plenty of blessings at the table. Whatever you need, just cry out to him right now. If it's for you, if it's for the children, your whole household, if it's for a family member or a family, invite them to hear this word. Hit the share button. Share to everybody that you know. Hit the share button. If you hit the share button, you're passing along the food that's on the table. You're passing out the seconds. What's left over? You just got your, your meat, your bread, your food now. Now go feed somebody else. What a mighty God we serve. Yeah. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, don't think the service is over. We're about to go right now into communion. Yeah. So go ahead. Get your Kool-Aid. Get your water. Get your juice. Get your bread. Get your crackers. Join us for communion. We're going to all take it together. Go ahead. I'll give you a moment. Go ahead and join us. We're about to have communion. Right in the house of the Lord, and we're not going to leave you out. We're doing this live. Take part with us. If you're a believer in Christ, this is for you. The Bible doesn't say you have to be baptized to take communion. But you do have to be a believer. Yes, and if you're a believer, at some point you need to get baptized. Do it quickly. But that doesn't stop you from taking communion. You can't show me one scripture that says it does. If you confess Jesus right now in your heart, you can take it. You can take communion. So go ahead. Get your supplements. If you got the grape juice, get it. Get it. Get it. Water. Get it. Kool-Aid. Juice. Apple juice. Whatever. Get it. Come on. We're about to take it right now. And just as we get ready to take it, 
We're going to have Elder Thomas give us the reason why we're partaking in communion this morning. we are partaking in communion is because we always want to remember what Christ did for us on Calvary. Yes. We never ever want to forget the sacrifice that was made for each and every last one of us. He didn't have to leave glory to come down and reconcile us back to God. He could have stayed right there and said, you know, let them deal with it however which way they can deal with it. But that wasn't the will of God. God's will is that all might be saved. That all might be saved. And so he, what he did was he took his word, he wrapped it in flesh, let it come to earth. And, and everybody that chose Christ, everybody that confessed and believed would have that bridge built between them and God all over again. Why do we take communion? It's not for our benefit as to uh, give us some supplement or anything. We can eat whatever we want. We can drink whatever we desire. It's not for that, but it's to always keep in the forefront of our mind what happened so many years ago. We do this in remembrance of how Christ came, he was born, he lived his life, he was crucified, but not only that, but he got up again for each and every last one of us. That's why we take communion, because he got up in each and every last one of our lives. That's why we do it, because we always want to remember the sacrifice that was made so many years ago on Calvary. At this time, come on, we're going to pass out the trays. This is your opportunity to take a moment of silence and pray. Come on, if you're viewing us, pray with us right now. Ask God to forgive you of your sins. Ask God to help you to get things right with people that you that you know. Some of y'all got people problems. And you need to get right with some people. Maybe it wasn't your fault. But God told you to be the bigger person. So if God told you to be the bigger person, do it then. Go into our ammunition and the army, armor of the Lord. And seek them out. Make the record straight. For the Bible says, how can you say that you love God who you haven't seen, but yet you hate your neighbor that you do see? It's a contradiction of your faith. And so the true evidence that you love God is that you love people.
At the same time, now we're about to prepare ourselves to give. Don't go yet. Stay with us. We're about to give. You can look on the screen. You can give from PayPal, the Cash App, as well as Giftify. You'll see it right there on the screen. This is your time to sow, ladies and gentlemen. So as the Lord has led you, be a blessing to the house of the Lord. If you believe this is good ground, so like it's good. If you believe like we do, that the harvest is always greater than the planet. You sow a seed, but you get back a harvest. You sow an apple seed, but yet you get back an apple tree that you can eat off of. Over and over again to your delight. And so let us prepare to sow. We already know here at Gospel Gospel Church, most of us, we give electronically, but give however you choose. This is your opportunity. Digging this Houston, can you pray real quick? As we get ready to sow, they waiting on us. Everyone, please stand. In the sanctuary, please stand. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for, for what has transpired in this church so far. And now, Lord, it's time to give. God, we ask you to, to help us to, to, to meet the, the needs here at God's Way Gospel Church as we uh, go and, and, and uh, bless the people. Bless, we need we need money to bless the people. We need money to to, to uh, uh, pay the bills here. God, we just ask you to bless our tithes and our offerings. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hey, let us not forget the Craddock family who are not here. Their family was murdered. We want to be a blessing to them as well. So can you please so extra, whether if you're watching us on the screen or if you're here, let's be a blessing. Their parent did not have life insurance, and we're just trying to be a blessing to them as they go through this hard time of bereavement. And so we need your help to sow. So you can sow. Put on their credit family when you sow in that inbox when you send the money. And when you do that, we'll bless that family because they're in need. And one of the ways that we can show our support is by sowing a seed into those lives who are hurting. And so I'm going to read real quick what we believe in God for as we sow. Come on, join in with us. Here's what we're, we're looking at. The scripture says in Job 22, verse 28, Thou shalt also declare a thing, and it shall be established unto thee. And the light shall shine upon our ways. As we sow, we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. Raises and bonuses. Come on, repeat with us. Sales and commissions. Benefits. Estates and inheritance. Houses and land. I can't hear y'all. Rebates and returns. Interest and income. Checks in the mail. Money management. Contracts. Gifts and surprises. Come on, y'all. Finding money. Bills paid off. Debts demolished. Royalties received. Scholarships and grants for our babies. And for some of us grown folks, healing and divine help, and answer prayer. Come on, it's time to sow. You can come right now. God bless you, everybody who's been watching. We'll see you on next week, 1030 a.m. is when we get started inside. 11 o'clock, you'll see us on live streaming. God bless you. Remember, 15501 Euclid Avenue in the great city of Houston.